Good morning and thank you all very much for joining me for today's webinar. This morning we celebrate our 14th uh, ETF listing on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and this latest ETF is the Signia Artrix New China Sectors ETF. But before we get started on talking about the product in specific and all things China, I do want to cover some general um, ETF content. So firstly, for some of you that may not be as familiar or as comfortable with these instruments, an ETF stands for an exchange traded fund, and it really is an listed investment product that tracks the performance of a group of, or a basket of shares or bonds or commodities. And these baskets are known as indices, and an index could be one such as the FTSE JSC Top 40, for example. If you look at the little graphic that I have included, an ETF can be described as something in between, it's almost like a stock, but it's almost like a mutual fund or a unit trust as well. So it trades like a stock because it is listed on a stock exchange, so you can buy it and sell it throughout the day, just like you can an ordinary share, but it's one instrument that provides you with diversified exposure to a basket of different securities. So in that way, it can be more similar to a unit trust. And in fact, by definition, it is just a unit trust that is listed on an exchange. So this graphic summarizes this quite nicely. It does have features of um, an ordinary share as well as the unit trust. Now, from a bit, for a bit of a history lesson, how did these ETFs come about? Now it's 2022 and we often have this debate about active versus passive investing, but this debate is not new and in fact passive investing became popular way back in the mid 70s. At that stage it was done by a unit trust and these were very complex, quite illiquid and quite complicated structures. So already back then industries across the globe or for the financial industry started to think about how they could possibly create something that's easier um, for investors to access passive products. And the first ETF was born and launched on the Toronto Stock Exchange back in 1990. So today we find ourselves more than 30 years later and ETFs have become extremely popular. There's new listings all over the globe all the time and there's more and more products for um, investors to choose from. The ETF market has grown enormously, which I will show you over the next slide. And nowadays you can find so many very you know, niche opportunities um, in, um, you know, wrapped up in an ETF as well. In terms of assets under management, they now boast over 10 trillion US dollars. And um, there's a research firm ETFGI that uh, you know tracked kind of the global industry and according to them there's more than 9,000 different ETFs that were traded as at the end of December 2021. So simply a huge amount of different products available all over the globe that provide us with easy and low cost access to certain sectors of the market. Now, in investing, we often get told not to put all of our eggs in one basket. An ETF easily solves this problem as you can buy one share, but this ETF itself is diversified by giving you exposure to a whole basket of different securities. As I mentioned, the assets under management globally has, you know, continues to grow year on year. ETFs just continue to become more popular and investors are switching from, uh, you know, active funds to passive instruments such as ETFs. And we can see that as at 20, the end of 2021, um, over 10 trillion US dollars in assets under management of ETFs and the growth between 2020 and 2021 was simply phenomenal. Now this, um, chart doesn't even go back to the 90s, but simply just from, you know, the early 2000s. And we can see every year there's just more and more assets that continue to flow into ETFs. Some of the ETF features, so they provide exposure to a variety of underlying instruments. So although you're buying one ETF and this ETF trades like a share on a stock exchange, your exposure is more often than not 
to a whole basket of different securities. So these can be bought and sold quite quickly because they do trade like an ordinary share. You can buy them and sell them just like you can any other share um, on the stock exchange. They're very well regulated. A lot of ETFs pay investors dividends. So Signia's ETFs, for example, we pay out dividends semi-annually. So when the underlying companies declare dividends, we then distribute those dividends semi-annually to the investors. The ETF uh, price fluctuates um, with the fluctuation of the underlyings, but because it's diversified, the risk of losing money is lowered relative to a single share, for example. And investors also have options as to how they can actually access these ETFs. So you could open a brokerage account, um, you know, through an authorized JSC equity member. You could open up an investment plan with ETF providers such as ourselves. And you could use, you know, different platforms. So there's some platforms where you can purchase ETFs from uh, many different um, issuers. And just some stats as at the end of March from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, there were 87 ETFs as at the end of March. So today's listing makes, you know, the total number of ETFs on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange 88. And you can see the total value traded, the average value traded and the market cap of these instruments um, is growing quite nicely and is simply phenomenal. As I mentioned, I mean, these instruments have been around for over 30 years now. So you get many different types of ETFs. What we'll focus on today and today's product is an index tracking ETF. So it's designed to track a particular index as closely as possible. But, you know, if you think globally and even locally of the many different types of ETFs that you get, you also have actively managed ETFs, you get ETFs tracking bond indices, you also get ETFs that track the performance of a certain commodity such as gold or platinum. You get ETFs that are focused on a certain industry. So if you think about our healthcare ETF that we launched towards the end of last year, that gives you exposure to a certain industry, which is healthcare in the example that I'm using. You get style ETFs, so you maybe want to follow a growth style or a value style. Um, you can actually find an ETF for that. You have inverse ETFs, foreign market ETFs that gives you exposure to, you know, markets outside of the one that you're in. And then you also have exchange traded notes that are issued mostly by banks. So many, many different types of ETFs. And we use ETFs extensively in our portfolio construction process. So in our multi-asset uh, balanced funds. So if you think about a signature or a skeleton 70 portfolio, the way that we construct the portfolios for this low growth environment that we believe will play itself out over the next couple of years is we follow a core satellite approach to portfolio construction where we have your more traditional asset classes as the core of the portfolio. So you want this diversified core. Um, we use indices or ETFs where possible to lower the cost. And then we add these thematic satellites. And in a low growth environment, these thematic satellites really provide that uncorrelated source of return. And these are, in our opinion, you know, high growth sectors that can really um, add value to the portfolio over the long term. So some of these satellites that we include in our portfolio constructions are things such as disruptive technologies. So here we would have something like the Fourth Industrial Revolution Fund, global real estate. We would use our property ETF there. Value is more of a shorter term uh, satellite that we have included to take advantage of the rising interest rate environment. Health innovation is a theme that we believe will add, uh, you know, to the performance of the portfolios over the next couple of years. So here we would use our healthcare ETFs. And then Emerging Asia is another satellite um, in our portfolios that we uh, believe really makes sense from a portfolio construction perspective. So Emerging Asia is attractive due to the high growth rates that are expected from these Asian economies over the next couple of years, the growing middle-class population. 
And here we would include our emerging markets ETF. And then of course, uh, today we are talking about um, the China ETF that we are launching. And I will touch on the details of this China ETF um, again a little bit later on, but this is exactly where it would fit in from a portfolio construction process. You could create your very own wild diversified portfolio just with ETF. So it would be low cost, but it would still give you very wild diversified exposure. And the way to do that is for the core of your global portfolio, you could track a broad market index, such as the MSCI World or the S&P 1200 ESG index. So that would give you core world exposure. Then you could have exposure to certain regions that may be of interest to you something like Japan or the Eurozone, you could include some exposures to certain regions. You could include a satellite uh, to disruptive technologies by investing in the fourth industrial revolution fund. You could access the healthcare theme uh, via the healthcare ETF that we have on offer. And then in this emerging markets um, theme, or satellite, you could include uh, the emerging markets ETF that was launched last year, and then today's one that we will talk about that gives you access to China. So I have already touched on a couple of features of ETFs, and we have established that they're very popular, they continue to grow year on year, but just some of the biggest benefits in our opinion of ETFs. It has to be cost, number one, Many, many good ETFs have very low fees. We know how important fees are in you know, your overall investment outcomes. The easy access, I touched on this as well. You can access them via stockbroking accounts or via platforms. Um, and for individual investors, there's a huge benefit to be able to have global access without having to worry about exchange control. So you're sitting in South Africa, you're buying a share uh, that's just trading on the JSC or this instrument, this ETF trading on the JSC. It's giving you exposure to the Chinese market, but you're not actually externalizing your money. So you don't have to worry about the exchange control limits. So there's many other benefits, but just to summarize, really, these three are probably the main ones. ETFs have many applications and, uh, you know, institutional investors could use them in portfolios for tactical adjustments or even individual investors. They could form the core of a portfolio, as I mentioned. They can be used in rebalancing, in portfolio completion. So there's many, many different applications for ETFs. And, you know, in the, the industry locally and globally has realized how you know, easy these instruments are to operate and that's why they continue to grow um, year on year. And then on the fees, if you listen to a lot of our webinars, this is a slide that we like to use quite often. And it really talks to how important fees are, especially over the longer term, and how high fees really can eat away at your investment value, especially when you consider the effects of compounding. So this was a study done by uh, National Treasury, and it states that if a regular saver is able to reduce the charges on the retirement account from 2.5% of assets each year to a half a percent of assets annually, their benefit at retirement would be 60% greater. So it can have lower fees, can make a huge impact to your final investment outcome. And this is why ETFs do make sense and many other passive products. Two and a half percent may sound like a lot, but we do know that there's a lot of active managers charging very high fees, especially uh, managers that provide exposure to these more niche kind of um, asset classes. So why specifically Signia's ETFs? Well, we do things quite differently, especially um, relative to our local competitors in the space. One thing that we do quite differently is for all of our ETFs that track global indices, we manage these via direct holdings, meaning that we're buying all the underlying instruments, we're trading in the various markets. Um, whereas 
our competitors in South Africa buy into feeder funds. So they would, for example, take an iShares ETF, wrap it up and list it on the stock exchange. By managing it via direct holdings, we're able to control costs. So we know upfront uh, you know, what it will cost us to run this ETF. To be able to keep uh, costs quite low. We also track the indices very closely, so there's tracking efficiencies. Um, our market maker is a global company called Jane Street. They trade across the globe in various markets, so they're really that other side of the trade. Um, and um, you know, by being a, able to partner with uh, big quantitative trading firms such as Drain Street, we're able to offer you know really good market depth and tight spreads on our ETFs. Signia also has a long history of indexation. It goes right back to the early 2000s, and it's back in 2016 where we started already to think about passive ways to provide um, exposure to themes. And it was back in 2016 that we launched um, our fourth industrial revolution fund um, and our bank plus fund providing you uh, or providing our investors with exposure to a certain theme, the technology theme, but um, in a low cost way via passive instruments. In 2020, we launched our health innovation fund. And last year, we launched an ESG ETF that was the Signia Artrix S&P Global 1200 ESG ETF, our Emerging Markets 50 ETF, as well as a healthcare ETF. And this year, we're starting off with the launch of uh, this ETF, which I'll talk about shortly. And then we've got a few others um, in the pipeline as well. But most importantly, we do believe that passive investing just simply makes sense. Low management fees have a huge impact, as I showed you, on the final investment outcomes. I will show you over the next couple of slides that from a performance perspective, passive really um, does um, you know, make sense. Um, there's wide range of themes and options. As we spoke about it a little bit earlier when I showed you the slides of the different types of ETFs that you have, there's so many themes that you can gain access to passively and in a low cost manner. The beauty about ETFs is the efficient and immediate implementation. Um, if you had to have an interest in this ETF, you can simply log onto your stockbroking account, you know, right now or after this webinar, it's already live on the JSC and you can simply purchase it as easy as purchasing any other share. And more and more investors worldwide are opting for passive solutions. And we can see this in the slide that just shows us the share of US equity funds that were managed passively and those active uh, managed actively since 2005. And you can see that the proportion of passive funds continues to grow and the proportion of active funds um, is um, getting lower as more and more investors realize that the low fees and top performance does make sense in their performance in their portfolios. So looking at these surveys that show us, you know, the percentage of uh, funds, passive funds um, that have outperformed uh, active or vice versa over the last five years. In the United States, over the last five years to the end of December 2021, 74.1% of active funds underperformed uh, passive over those five years. In South Africa, that was 55.88%. In Canada, 95.71% of funds underperformed the passive benchmark. In Europe, almost 73%. In India, over 82%. In Australia, just over 73%. So you can see that it's across the globe, across the regions, over the long term, active managers, are struggling to outperform the passive benchmarks. In terms of our product offering, with today's listing, we now have 14 ETFs on offer. On the right-hand side, we have our two local equity funds. So these track local South African indices. We have the Signia Artrix 640 ETF, as well as the Signia Artrix Top 40 ETF. And then on the right hand side is all of the ETFs that give you access to global markets. At the bottom, you'll see that we have three specialist funds. So these specialist funds 
it would give you exposure to a certain sector. So we've got the Signia Artrix Global Property Fund that will give you exposure to global property. The Signia Artrix Fourth Industrial Revolution ETF, which is uh, you know, very much technology focused and really focused on technologies at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution. And then the Signia Artrix Solactive Healthcare 150 ETF, which would give you exposure to the global healthcare sector. And then we've got our regional funds. So these would give you exposure to a certain region. So the MSCI world would give you world exposure, the Eurostox 50 exposure to the Eurozone. Um, we've got the Japanese ETF that would give you exposure to the Jap Japan's market. Um, then the US market, the FTSE 100 is the UK market, the S&P 500 is the US market. The S&P 1200 ESG ETF gives you global exposure. It has a little bit of emerging markets, but predominantly developed market exposure. But of course, with that ESG flavor where companies are filtered to make sure uh, that you know certain companies involved in, for example, tobacco or controversial weapons are excluded. Um, so that uh, can be a good call for portfolios. You've got your emerging markets 50 ETF, and then of course the new China sectors ETF, which is the one that we launched this morning and we'll talk about today. From a performance perspective, we can see, uh, you know, the performance, especially over the last couple of months with the RAND strengthening and a lot of these being global indices, we do see some impact in RAND terms, but over the long term, a lot of them providing really good um, returns to portfolios. And I mean, the returns of these ETFs are very much in line with the returns of the benchmarks, which is the indices that they track. So now that I have covered some, you know, information on the ETF industry in general, as well as our product range, I'd like to spend um, the rest of this morning's presentation really talking about China and then the specific product that we have launched this morning. So starting off with why China and what really is the investment case for China? The investment case is that if you want a global portfolio that's truly representative of the global economy, then China cannot be ignored. However, China is ignored in a way. It's very much underrepresented in all portfolios and in benchmarks in certain indices. So it's underrepresented relative to its importance in the world. China contributes close to 20% to global GDP even more to GDP growth, but it comprises only about 4% of the MSCI All Country World Index, which is one of the most popular benchmarks used to benchmark global portfolios against. And it's specifically China A shares, and I will discuss the different types of shares a little bit later on, but China A shares are really domestically listed companies. These shares have been excluded from a lot of these uh, big indices and benchmarks. Another reason to consider China and consider investing in China is looking at innovation. So many Chinese companies are very innovative um, and some of the largest patent holders in the world are in China. So if you look at the top eight patent holders, 91 and with number one is a Korean company, the next six are all in China and then um, number eight is an American company. And if you have focused on, you know, the Chinese Communist Party's five-year plans, they issued their 14th five-year plan, which really talks about the year 2021 to 2025 and, you know, previous five-year plans, their goals are really around common prosperity for their people. So they've already lifted millions and millions of people out of poverty, and they intend on increasing, uh, you know, this middle class population and making the Chinese consumer even more prosperous and more healthy. And a prosperous consumer and a healthy middle class is really good for GDP growth, and it's really good for certain sectors. The main sectors that would actually benefit from a healthier consumer 
a more prosperous consumer would be, you know, industries such as consumer discretionary, consumer staples, communication services, healthcare and insurance companies. These are really the companies that benefit most from a prosperous consumers. So these are really the goals of China. And this is why China over the next couple of years um, is um, attractive. So just as a graphic representation, if you look on the right hand side, China is too big to ignore. They are a major player in the global economy from a population perspective. They've got a vast population. They contribute a lot to GDP, contribute a massive amount to world exports, yet their inclusion in global indices is very, very small. But this is changing and it is set to increase. This common prosperity that I spoke about and the increase in the middle class. Analysts state that, you know, the middle class will account for more than a third of China's population by 2030, so just over the next couple of years, and consumer spending will equate to basically be uh, what the consumer spending is in the EU today. So the Chinese consumer and the power of the Chinese consumer cannot be ignored. Relative to other countries, you know, if you consider the contribution to GDP and um, the allocation of those countries in world indices, looking at the US, yes, massive economy, biggest economy in the world, they contribute a lot to GDP, but they also make up 61% of the MSCI equity index, whereas China, second largest economy in the world, whereas they are a very, very small percentage, about 4% of the MSCI equity world, uh, all country world index. So this would never be you know, a perfect representation, but you can see how far um, away um, the, you know, the numbers are from the contribution to global economy versus its inclusion in the indices. In this chart on the right hand side, we can also see how, um, you know, it has been increasing. The China share of global GDP has been increasing and it's set to continue to increase over the next couple of years. Whereas the other big developed economies, uh, you know, collective share of GDP is actually reducing. So a massive, massive economy second largest um, equity market globally valued at over 18 trillion US dollars. It is dominant in emerging market indices such as the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, but it's set to increase going forward. China does have characteristics of developed markets and it will likely transition to be a developed market um, in the long run. There has been regulatory risks, and this is not something new, although there was a major focus on these regulatory risks, especially recently, um, you know, the second half of 2021. These regulatory risks and the sell-off that we have seen in a lot of Chinese equities, you could argue that it has actually created a very attractive um, entry point for Chinese tech specifically. Now, speaking about the regulations last year, and I'm pretty sure that most of you, um, even if you weren't so focused on, you know, reading about China itself, because they had a knock on effect on our local market, um, you know, we all read about, uh, you know, these Chinese regulations because they did impact Tencent, which in turn um, affected NASPAS and process in our very own local market. But, what we saw in terms of regulations, and this was the Chinese government, you know, uh, cracking down on a lot of tech stocks, limiting, you know, gaming hours, uh, you know, against the education sector. There were some regulations as well that affected those big ten companies. That was not something new. In fact, there's been a bear market in China nearly every year. So if you look at the 17 of the last 20 years, there has been a bear market in China. And it usually has been driven by some or other policy issue. Now, the good news is that these bear markets were often followed by really good returns. So investors could have been rewarded by, you know, sticking through the volatility uh, and going through, you know, the downs um, of the markets to experience um, the high returns that followed these bear markets. And this is what's represented on the bottom right hand side of my slides. 
And a lot of the media and a lot of investor concerns were focused on these sectors that were negatively affected by Chinese new regulations. So those were, you know, internet, education and gaming, for example. And many of these issues that were regulated were not unique to China. These are um, issues that the West is also focusing on. The problem with Chinese regulations is the speed at which they are announced, so they can uh, you know, cause a lot of uh, you know, shock and uh, concern and volatility in the markets among investors. Whereas regulations in the developed world, you tend to hear about you know, proposed regulations, analysts have time to kind of price it into markets. So by the time that regulations are actually put in place, it's very much uh, priced into markets and investors do expect it. Whereas with China, it can happen from one day to the next um, and that can uh, cause all this volatility in the markets. So as much as the focus has been on all of these sectors that were negatively affected, there are also many sectors that are supported by government. And these are sectors such as semiconductors, green technologies, and consumer brands. So the Chinese government is by no means you know, just cracking down on private businesses. They're simply um, you know, restructuring their economy. And as I mentioned, as the Chinese economy is becoming more and more open to foreign investors, and a lot of these big global indices are increasing their, their allocation to China, there is, uh, you know, this big likelihood for the demand, demand underpinned for especially China on, onshore shares that have been excluded from these indices, which will then reflect more of the economic reality. So speaking about the different types of shares, so China or exposure in portfolios to China has historically been dominated by foreign listings. So investors have been able to access, um, you know, exposure to China companies via listings in the US, for example, or in Hong Kong. But the capital market has developed and is becoming increasingly more open to investors. So the different types of shares and the reason why you have so many different types of shares really goes back to the history of not being able to access a lot of the onshore China shares and a lot of companies then decided to list elsewhere. So China A shares are companies that are listed in Shanghai or Shenzhen in local currencies, so in Renminbi. And the only way to really trade these shares is if you have a qualified foreign institutional investor license or via a Stockholm uh, you know, Connect program. So not everybody is able to trade these shares very easily. Um, and this is why they are very much underrepresented in global portfolios. Then you get the B shares. And if you just look at this little graphic, sorry to go back to the A shares, but represented in blue, you can see that in terms of market cap and in terms of the number of stocks, these China A shares, so companies listed on these local mainland China exchanges, really do form the biggest proportion um, of shares. And then the B shares, very small, it's represented in purple. These are um, also, Chinese companies incorporated in China, but they are priced in USD. Then your HS, P chips, and red chips are Chinese companies that are listed in Hong Kong. Um, and your NSHAs and ADRs are Chinese companies that are listed in the US, for example. So it's really these second last categories, so the H shares and the N shares and ADRs that investors have been um, able to access more easily. Now, the A shares, as I mentioned, you can you know, trade these via, um, if you have a qualified um, foreign institutional investor license. And what this really is, is a program that was introduced by China back in the early 2000s that provides foreign institutional investors, such as ourselves, for example, with the right to trade on these local mainland China exchanges. So before the launch of this program, and the country had very tight capital controls and it prohibited investors uh, from other nations other than you know, Chinese investors from actually buying and selling stocks on the Chinese exchanges. 
Now, this QFI license then does provide us with um, the ability to actually buy and sell these A shares that are listed in mainland China. And we're only the second asset manager in South Africa to be granted this license. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that we do trade via direct holdings or we manage our ETFs via direct holdings. So we are physically buying all the underlying securities that will be in the benchmark and that will include these Chinese A shares as well. Now, if you saw in the name of this new ETF, we're not just talking about broad, you know, China exposure, but we're talking about specific sectors. So we're talking about the new China and the new China sectors. So why the new China and what really is the new China? So historically, Chinese growth has been driven by companies in the banking, natural resources and manufacturing sectors. And many of these are state-owned enterprises. But as China's economy has been maturing and the Chinese government has been carrying out these structural reforms, uh, you know, promoting initiatives to support more uh, sustainable economic growth, then, you know, it's really consumption and service related industries that are becoming structurally more important. We're seeing that there's rising household income and this adoption of technological advancements. So people are, you know, online shopping, for example, and using a lot more of these internet and mobile services. So this is stimulating a new way of spending. And this, you know, has uh, resulted in these consumption and services industries becoming even more uh, important from a growth perspective. So if you look um, at the bottom right hand side, for example, uh, this little graph that I have included, you'll see, you know, services um, in the pink line. Um, so the percentage of uh, these industries that are contributing to GDP and you can see services is increasing, whereas your old China sector such as manufacturing um, and agriculture are becoming a smaller uh, proportion um, in terms of their contribution um, to GDP. And if you look on the left hand side, you can see that the share of um, China in terms of global consumption just continues to grow and it's forecast to grow a whole lot more by, for example, 2040, which is what's included in this um, little graphic that I have in the bottom. So you'll see the red represents China. So you can see their share in global consumption, just growing, 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 growing. And by 2040, um, it will be a huge percentage um, of, um, you know, this global consumption growth. So this expanding middle class that I spoke about, you know, because of this goal of common, common prosperity that they have for their people. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, this middle class is expected to reach the levels seen in the Eurozone just by 2030, which is really, really um, not too far away. And middle class is defined somewhere uh, around having household income of about you know, 20,000 US dollars. And the amount of Chinese people that will have this amount of money by 2035 is forecast to be uh, more than 400 million. Um, so it will become the largest consumer market in the world, as we can see um, you know, in this graphic that I have here as well. So these consumption um, and service related industries are the ones that are benefiting from this huge growth in the middle class from all of these uh, reforms by the Chinese government. And it's really, you know, these are the sectors to be focused on if you really want to take advantage of this, uh, you know, structural shift in the economies. Now, because most broad market indices have significant exposure to the old economy, there's been more and more investors that are looking for ways to access, you know, China's new economy um, and the sectors that will benefit from these changes. And this new ETF that we have launched this morning, the Signia Atrix New China Sectors ETF, uh, we believe meets this need in the marketplace as it is focused on these new China sectors. So let's talk about a little bit about the product. 
So firstly, if you want to you know, trade it, uh, the code on the JSC will be 6CN, so S-Y-G-C-N. Um, very easy to remember, Signia China. That's what it really stands for. So what is this ETF? Well, it's a passively managed index tracking fund, but the index that it will be tracking will be this S&P New China Sectors Index. And I will touch on what this index includes over the next slide. The risk profile is high. The reason why it has a high risk profile attached to it is because it is 100% global equity. So you know, by buying into this, you will be exposed to 100% global equities. And by definition, we know that uh, this is more volatile in nature. So for that reason, it is just categorized as high risk. Although it is diversified, you will be exposed to, you know, a number of different um, industries and companies. So in that way, the risk is reduced. But because it is global equities, um, you know, the time horizon that is, uh, you know, attached to this would be recommended that it's a long term uh, time horizon. From a cost perspective, the total expense ratio is 50 basis points. So this is a targeted term, meaning that, um, you know, we have set the management fee as well as the total expense ratio at 50 basis points and any fee um, over and above that will be covered by um, Signia. Now to talk about this index. So as I mentioned, this ETF will track the S&P New China Sectors Index. And what this index will include will be companies in these consumer um, and service orientated industries, but it includes all the A shares as well as offshore listings, for example, in Hong Kong, in the US and Singapore. If you look on the right hand side of this chart, you will see some of the sectors um, that are very much, you know, these new China sectors that we're focusing on. So it's your consumer shares, it's healthcare, communication, insurance. These are all the sectors that are set to benefit from this growth um, in the Chinese middle class. In terms of a number of constituents, you can expect uh, no more than 300. And in terms of exposure to a single instrument uh, or single company, that will be capped at 10%. Some of the top 10 holdings, I'm sure you're aware of quite a number of these companies. Um, so it will be, you know, some tech companies, the likes of Tencent, Alibaba, uh, Baidu, all of these are, you know, big technology, internet, online shopping kind of companies. Then you've got some, uh, you know, electric uh, suppliers such as Medea. You've got some beverage companies. So it's all of these consumer type of shares, a number of insurance companies that also benefit from um, this growth in the middle class. So this is what you can expect just from a top 10 holdings perspective, but very well diversified in that it holds um, close to 300 different constituents. So what we believe are some of the benefits of this, you know, S&P New China Sectors Index and really just focusing on that sector of the economy. Firstly, the full opportunity set is targeted. So we're not excluding China A shares because they're difficult to trade. Um, it includes A shares, which do form, as you saw a little bit earlier, a big proportion of the availability of Chinese companies. But we're also including, um, you know, the index also includes Hong Kong and um, other listings that are really representative um, of the availability of Chinese companies. Then the focus on the specific industries is really uh, beneficial as, as I mentioned, these are really the industries that are set to uh, benefit the most from all of these structural reforms happening in China. And then there are liquidity benefits by only really focusing on the largest 300 companies um, uh, you know, there's, you know, many liquid stocks in there, which make for um, efficient portfolio management of this ETF. If you look at the sector breakdown, which I have included on the right hand side, very different to what you find in other Chinese indices, 
you'll see that more than um, just more than 50% of uh, the total exposure will be to consumer discretionary and consumer staple shares. And then if you have to add to that the next bigger sectors, which is communication services and healthcare, then over 80% of the exposure would be to these consumer communication and healthcare stocks. So very different to what you find in other Chinese um, indices. And looking at the, um, one of the Hong Kong um, indices, for example, the Hang Seng, we can see that the exposures there are quite different. So if you had to only have exposure to Chinese companies uh, via you know, these listings in Hong Kong and you had to track this index, for example, your exposure, more than 50% of the exposure wouldn't be to the consumer shares and the healthcare and the communication, but it would rather be to financials and information technology. So you can see, you know, investing in China really is all about where you invest. No one index is, you know, the same as the other and the exposures can be vastly different. What's also different is, of course, the performance. So now that we've compared these two indices, the Hang Seng China Enterprise Index, which is the Hong Kong one, with the um, S&P New China Sectors Index, which is the one that our ETF is tracking, you can see that there has been quite a big difference in performance over the last couple of years. So China, all very exciting. Of course, it does come with risks and volatility, but we do believe that it does have a place in a good overall global portfolio. So to end off my presentation, before I take a couple of questions, this ETF is already live. I uh, started uh, with listed on the JSC today, and you're able to trade it from today, the 20th of April, 2022 and it will be available on A2X um, in the next couple of days. And as always, I'd like to just end my presentation just uh, talking about you know, why we really believe um, ETFs are the future and make sense um, in a lot of portfolios. So I'm ending off with a couple of quotes. And this first one by Jack Vogel says, don't look for the needle in the haystack, it just rather buy the haystack. And this is what ETFs are about. Instead of trying to find that one share that you will believe will be, you know, the next Amazon, for example, just buy a whole basket of them. Um, and it should provide you with a way, very well diversified um, growth exposure. Then Dave from ETF.com says, ETFs are fundamentally a technology. They're a mechanism to achieve a certain goal like phones. Traditional mutual funds were the rotary phones and ETFs are the smartphones. They do the same thing, but they are in a better package. And I totally agree. They provide you with a diversified, you know, passive exposure, but you can also trade them on a stock exchange. John Stain says ETF portfolios will be the inevitable default for investors in the years to come because they are lower cost, they're transparent, and they offer great liquidity and tax advantages. And then lastly, Martin Small from BlackRock says that ETFs aren't just having a moment, they're creating a movement. And this is certainly something that we are seeing when we're looking at the growth of the AUM and the number of products available globally. Um, you know, year on year, it just keeps increasing. So I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. Um, I hope that uh, many of you are as excited as we are about this launch of this new fund, and we do believe that it will add great diversification to um, your overall global portfolios. Thank you.